Welcome everyone. We are at the second public cradle event. I can hear a slight echo. Sorry, third public cradle event for our International Symposium on Authentic Assessment, which has been chaired by Professor Rollo Jawi. Uh, this event, we are focused on the digital in authentic assessment. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're currently standing here, those of us physically here, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and acknowledge their elders past and present, and also acknowledge this is a really, really hard time. I don't know about the rest of you, but we woke up on Sunday morning and just had a really hard chat with the kids about what, what does this all mean? How do we move forward? Um, so I would like to acknowledge that there's been education happening here on these stolen lands for a very long time. Today, we're here to talk about the digital in authentic assessment. Um, authentic assessment is a troubled and troubling term. It's an exciting term. In the course of these couple of days that we've been working on trying to blow up and reconstitute authentic assessment here, I think we, we've come to some places that would be really good if we can share with those of you online and those of you in the room and, and engage in some sort of dialogue. So that's, that's our goal. We've got a wonderful set of panellists today and we thought that it would be really good to get my dear colleague, Professor Margaret Beerman, to kind of set the scene on where are we with respect to authentic assessment and the digital I've got a bio for Margaret, but it would feel deeply impersonal to read it uh, about you. She's an amazing scholar of note in assessment, really leading work in the digital and has been doing it before it was cool. Uh, so I'd love to welcome up Professor Margaret Beerman. Oh, Phil, what a lovely, lovely intro. I think that's probably one of the nicest ones I've, I've ever had. Well, thank you all. I'm going to be incredibly brief. I just want to frame this up before you get to the um, um, voices that we have, the panellists that we have for you, because we've been in discussion with them and, and I think what they have to say is truly interesting. Um, I'm getting a little bit of echo to my left, which Phil has just, just fixed, so I'm not sure if you were getting the echo or my echo. Um, but that surely is part of living in a digital world, all the echoes that we have. And you will have seen the slide up there for a while. And I really wanted to orient us uh, collectively to this notion of the digital world. So it's really this idea, and sometimes people call it post-digital, that digital technologies and increasingly powered with data and artificial intelligence, which is what I would regard Google as. So, you know, if you're using Google, you're certainly playing in that sandpit. These technologies have become entangled and constitutive with everyday life. And it's only on the odd occasion when we go camping or we detox or we move away from the, we are away from the digital. It is omnipresent. Thus, we're using here the term the digital. And in this way, we're kind of avoiding some of the conversations about what we mean by technology enhanced assessment or e-assessment or all that sort of wording to sort of say that we're talking about both technologies, a technology, and a social practice. So we use the term digital, and this is quoting from a paper I wrote with um, um, Yusuf Niman and, who's, and um, Rola Ajabi, who are here in the room with me today, that the term digital reflects the duality of the digital being both a technology and a social practice. Therefore, the digital, when we refer to it, also encompasses practices that may not directly involve the the technological, but actually may be really relevant to how it is we need to live and work in a world that's enmeshed in it. I get a very easy job by saying this. Little attention has been paid to the digital and authentic assessment, um, and there's a couple of frameworks here. We have um, Kevin in the room and in 2014, which I think seven years ago, or no, it said, my gosh, nine years ago, how quickly time goes, um, Villa Royale, 2018, Sokanova, and no one really talks about the digital. So it's not something that's really present. And in partly in response to this, we did a critical scoping review. And again, with my colleagues, Yuso and Lola, we 
looked at how the digital has been designed into authentic assessment. And we did an analysis of 55 studies looking at authentic assessment in higher education that centralised the digital in their discussion. And um, we talked around these three purposes that we decided beforehand and one that came up inductively through the, through the process of the paper. We've talked about assessment design in the digital world. You can think of the digital as a tool that really is as a technology. And most studies, 52 of the 55, looked at this purpose. They, they looked to the purpose of using the digital as a tool and 27 of the 55 were focused on credentialing. So they, they were not really interested in assessment, or they may have been partially interested for, in assessment for learning, but they were primarily focused on assessment of learning. So already setting up some mode as how what we're thinking about when we think about the digital and assessment design. In digital literacies, and these are the these are the sorts of things one might need when working with the digital. We found that 29 of the studies engaged with the idea of promoting digital literacies, but all of these were around skills and mastery. There was nothing about critique or evaluation, and a lot of them were incredibly instrumental. Like, for example, through doing this assessment task, students will learn how to use um, Google Drive. Not really linked possibly to something much, much deeper than that. Um, although occasionally they were. Human capabilities, there are eight of the studies in that place. And by human capabilities, we mean things that are useful to work, not necessarily directly with technology, not a digital literacy, but alongside it. So in this instance, I'll give you an example here. Sergeant and Lynch did uh, digital video narratives in physical education. And these allowed students to explore um, how to be vulnerable, expressive, and their embodied connections. So something quite outside technology, yet technology facilitated that, that, that understanding. And the final one, which we found one study about, and we realised we hadn't captured in, in the framework, which we, we published beforehand, was around fostering community. And in this instance, the digital enabled students to go out and work in the community to do something with, um, I think it was, let me look, um, uh, supporting independent living a blind adolescence, so working with disability organisations. And through that work, they not only um, did something that was authentic and benefit to themselves in assessment, but they actually benefited the community as well too. So that's, I just wanted to lay that out because really as, as a collection of work and as a scoping review, I don't think we're looking at a lot of really extensive work or contemplation of this field. What was meant by authenticity? We relied on author self-reports. You had very limited or very implicit definitions, 21 loosely defined real world activities. As quite a few people referred to Wiggins, this sort of form of reflecting professional activities. And the digital mostly appeared present as an authentic task, but not always. Sometimes it was just there. Which means our panelists have a green field in front of them. <laughs> So anything that's said in this space and towards this working, I think, will be an absolute contribution because there's a lot of space. So I hope you enjoy your green fields. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I think, thanks so much, Margaret. Uh, it's always a joy when sitting on a panel to have someone say, there are green fields here, rather than think about all the research you haven't read before you say a word. Um, I'm going to engage in a bit of subterfuge here, a bit of uh, consider this a video game loading screen to, to situate us in the digital. We are both going to do some technical things to change some settings while I introduce our panellists. And it will be up to you to concentrate on the interesting introduction of the panellists rather than the video game loading screen of the things changing. So please do, do feel free to come on and, and change things. Okie dokie. So, the way the rest of our afternoon is going to run here is we have one, two, three, four chairs there, which will be occupied by four panellists for 
international slash national panelists who have been with us talking through authentic assessment for the past couple of days. They're each going to talk for about five minutes. I'm going to be really strict with them for the five minutes. Um, the degree of the strictness will just involve telling them when the time is over, but I've been told that's very strict. Um, after they've all said something, they will be invited to comment on what each other has said, because I doubt they're all going to agree with each other. It's not going to be some sort of blood sport, but there's going to be a little, little bit of disagreement. And then we will go to some questions from people in this room here with us, as well as people online. And what do we got? We have 108 online at the moment, people. Now, if you are online, you'll have to put your questions into the Q&A. There are currently zero questions in the online Q&A. So you have to put your questions there and upvote those. All right, I think I've done the preamble bit and covered the video game loading screen. Uh, so now we get the, the cool part, which is introducing our amazing panelists. So first up, we have Professor Krina Damsha. So Krina is professor at the Institute for Pedagogic and Vice Dean Innovation and Digitalization, Faculty of Education Sciences at the University of Oslo, Norway. And Krina's research focuses on social, cultural and technological aspects of learning across formal and informal settings, with an emphasis on dialogue, knowledge construction, and pedagogical innovation. Krita was our amazing keynote on Friday. You may all recognize her from there. So let's round of applause as Krita walks up. Now, Krita will be first to talk, but so she's not sitting there on her own in a chair talking, which would be weird. We will introduce the rest of our panelists. Uh, up next, we have Associate Professor Karen Gravett. Uh, Karen's Director of Research in Higher Education at the Surrey Institute of Education at the University of Surrey, which are very close collaborators of us here with Cradle. Uh, Karen's work focuses on theory and practice of learning in higher education. Her research sits at the intersection of higher education, philosophy and sociology, and explores how we can use theory to see key areas of higher education in new ways. And I said to Karen that I think she's probably one of the researchers who is a sort of cradle doctoral student favorite. They, they often cite and read your work. So big round of applause for Karen. Sorry people of mine, I just realized I've been clapping into a microphone. That must be horrendous. Uh, Next up, we have Dr. Lucinda McKnight. Lucinda is an ARC DECRA Fellow and Senior Lecturer in Pedagogy and Curriculum at Deakin. Lucinda conducts award-winning research into curriculum design's role in teacher identity, autonomy, and professionalism, especially in, in English. She's interested in creative teacher and student agency and in teacher recruitment and retention. And I think Lucinda also gets the, I was into it before it was cool badge, because uh, Lucinda's been doing at one of these incredibly competitive DECRA fellowships for years on the topic of artificial intelligence and, and writing. So she's well ahead of the curve. Huge round of applause for Lucinda. And last but not least, Professor Kevin Ashford Rowe, who's Pro Vice Chancellor Learning and Teaching and the Institutional Lead for Digital Transformation of Teaching and Learning Experience at QUT, Queensland University of Technology. Kevin has a wealth of experience in the implementation of innovative and flexible education and training delivery at all levels of curriculum design, development and delivery. He also has particular research interest in authentic assessment. So I knew about Kevin's authentic assessment work before because of the, the paper that Margaret uh, mentioned. I didn't know he's also a Lieutenant <laughs> Colonel. Uh, so Lieutenant Colonel Professor Ashford. <laughs> Wonderful. We have them here. They don't have light shining in their eyes from the projector. Great. Uh, please, uh, Krita, you, you can get us started with your thoughts from the symposium. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation. Um, very happy to be here, surrounded by experts, uh, very knowledgeable people, not least uh, native speakers, all of them, which I'm not. So I'm using, I hope you don't mind, I'm using some affordances here. Um, I will take a departure point in uh, the current conversation around Gen AI, which we're all familiar with, but that will just uh, help me to place my thoughts in, a, in, in the current uh, uh, context. 
Also, I might um, appear as a techno optimist in my discourse, which I am not at all, but uh, perhaps will, uh, will, it will help engaging in a conversation later on. So um, the discussion around generative AI has prompted me um, to reflect on whether we experience lost agency, um, our agency or misplaced agency in relation to technology. And I am claiming that we need to reposition first and foremost when thinking about education, um, learning, teaching and or assessment for that matter. We need to reposition or rebalance, if you wish, the agency in the relationship with uh, technology. Ever since the infusion of the digital into our work, learning and social life, lives, generative AI uh, being the latest example. A myth seems to reign that technology may determine what we do, um, that it take over, can take over uh, and that we are pow powerless actors in the face of a growing threat uh, for our ways of doing and ways of being. Agency needs to be rebalanced in that while understanding and accepting technology uh, have immense potential to shape human practices, um, education practices included, they are to be subsumed to our purposes uh, of and needs, of renewal, development of practices, and any pedagogical innovation uh, we may aspire to realize. There is both a long tradition of practice, empirical research, and theoretical knowledge that provides us with a um, basis for understanding the relationship with the digital in a more nuanced way. Uh, only this knowledge needs to be activated. So building on this point, I suggest that we need to consider digital uh, in an ecological relationship with learning and assessment. This implies that the digital and the pedagogical principles, practices, processes, resources in education are integrated uh, and influence and shape each other. In the authentic way, the digital is omnipresent in our daily lives. It is, or it should be, also present in the education context. To bridge context of learning and assessment, to create continuity between and across these contexts, and thereby infuse authenticity into the formal um, learning and assessment practice. Once agency that I was referring to is rebalanced, we come to understand, we can come to understand that the digital has the potential to make this connection between learning and assessment uh, and make it a generative one, rather than the digital being at, at, an add-on, a threat or dis disturbance. Uh, notions from theoretical notions from sociology of knowledge can help understand the function of the digital, I would say. For almost a, a year now, Gen AI has, an, has been an epistemic object. It was in the focus of our attention, conversation, inquiry, and perhaps worries. It is time to shift attention uh, to it as a technical or instrumental object, I would say, that, put, uh, that is put to work in a constructive way, according to the purposes we determine. Social cultural notions of the digital um, could be, um, for example, that of structuring resources or as a tool for meaning making, uh, and this can be instrumental in, in this particular case. In practice, this means that the design and practice of assessment and learning are not agnostic to the digital, as digital technologies can be part of shaping these practices in a natural way. Rather, as the digital is a natural element of an extended e ecology um, that offers possibilities for new ways of doing uh, assessment, which we may need to discover or design through research and innovation efforts. In my uh, talk on Friday, I elaborated on learning as a process um, that is complex and situated, and how this has consequences for how assessment should, should be designed and conducted. Within this context, technology and new ways of, uh, to access data from learning and assessment activities, while this creates challenges, um, can also create opportunities for accounting for this complexity and temporality. First, the availability of data, which the digital enables, uh, enables um, and new ways of collecting, analyzing, and interpreting uh, this data offers unique opportunities to document and understand aspects of learning behaviors and activities that might not have been explored before. Um, think of learning activities in digital environments, which we're all familiar with. Opportunities for following processes over time by gathering different data points create a stronger basis for informed assessment decisions. To fulfill this role, 
the digital needs to, or digital technologies need to be incorporated into design, both in its epistemic and instrumental functions, as I was referring to throughout the entire process. Second, we could capitalize better, I would say, upon such opportunities in our work with designing for learning and designing assessment. Data-driven design and practice, almost a commodity uh, at this point, uh, represent powerful affordances in a systematic approach to teaching and assessment. So while ethical challenges regarding students' privacy still need to be considered, data about activities, processes, and study progression, for example, can enhance reflection, a process-oriented, and evidence-based assessment practice. In a sense, what I am proposing is a more research-based, or at least research-informed approach to education when the digital is, is becoming part of this ecosystem. It is not only that research contributes evidence in how digital technologies may enhance or hinder learning and assessment work, and basic basis to better understand learners' sense-making processes, what they ultimately know and can do, and how they demonstrate it. I actually argue for going beyond only using research evidence to understand the digital in learning and assessment, I rather suggest employing actively particular research methodologies, such as design-based research, which can provide suitable and equitable approaches that can be applied to innovate the practice of teaching, assessment, and even policy making in assessment and education. Within this paradigm, iterative approaches, uh, mentioned also by Keith in yesterday's uh, panel discussion, offer this invaluable opportunity to, of multiple data points for assessment purposes, which could diminish the pitfall of momentary assessment and may increase ecological validity. Tim was referring to as well in, in our discussions yesterday. But they can also uh, be uh, incredibly instrumental in exploring and tailoring the assessment forms and ways of implementing them to do justice to complexity of the learning processes that unfolds over time and to its complexity. I'm also almost advocating for giving voice to educators and teachers through research and responsible innovation in engaging with the digital of the future. And I have a, an example from practices at my faculty of educational sciences at the University of Oslo, where a, a number of teachers have actually initiated research and development projects with generative AI in their classes. They started basically for form reformulating learning outcomes, redesigning learning tasks where students were invited to use uh, ChatGPT, for example. And they, together with the students, they redesigned assessment assignments. And, and eventually they collected data on this and then asked students to reflect how this worked out for them and provided a report to the faculty leadership. Uh, with suggestions on how that could be taken up uh, institutionally. I'm almost done. Um, and finally, institutionally, not to be forgotten, the institutional responsibility and implications of the digital being a salient element of the educational context and assessment work are considerable and crucial. It is important to make explicit the layers of this responsibility. An ethical responsibility comes down to um, responsible selection of digital technology to be implemented for teaching, learning, and assessment in a way that enables development and does not generate additional challenges or increase inequalities. And this comes from a discussion we had this morning um, uh, in our closed group. The responsibility of making informed decisions, uh, informed decisions of, for these selections, and rather informed by educational research and teacher and learner expertise and experience with assessment so far. And lastly, the strategic implementation of digital technology should be geared uh, at the institutional level towards providing affordances and structures and opening for experimentation, but also for failure and for iterative renewal rather than prioritizing monetary aspects. So in conclusion, for all learners, Education, educators, teachers, not least for um, IT colleagues in the IT department, approaching the digital as a natural and authentic element uh, may require a shift in thinking and doing. Then it's critically to uh, quote Kelly Matthews during our discussions today, thoughtfulness of the ethical dimension and guidance and research informed practice. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, it's a joy to hear you speak about the importance of researching assessment and research for assessment. And we did not pay her nor influence her to make a talk at the Centre for Research and Assessment on Digital Learning celebrating the need for assessment research. Okay, very small amount of laughs here in the room, just for those online. <laughs> if you're thinking, I laughed out loud online at home, know that you were not joined by people in the room. Uh, the microphone has been passed. Now, Karen, are you? Yeah, Karen Gravett yeah, is up next. So. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Phil, and thanks so much, Krina, um, and to Margaret for starting us off. So I'm really excited to explore this lovely green field that um, we've got ahead of us and to think with you about these really thorny and amorphous concepts of the digital and authenticity and assessment. These are massive ideas, and we thrashed them out the past um, day and a half uh, here. Um, so when I was thinking about these ideas, I was thinking about how um, as Margaret reminded us, there's actually um, quite a, a, a few conceptual problems with the ways in which we've been approaching um, these complex ideas so far. Um, so there's a lot of work if we think about authenticity and assessment, and we've been talking about this together today and yesterday, there's a lot of work that focuses on thinking about authenticity and assessment as something very task focused and as something that attempts to represent a supposedly exterior real world, which I find a little bit difficult. But similarly, um, if we think about the digital, as Margaret signaled, often the digital in this space is either omitted or it's perceived um, instrumentally as a tool, something that we just use. Um, and I really like a recent paper by Jan MacArthur, who talks about some of these conceptual problems. And she says that so far to date, much of the authentic assessment literature uses a fairly disarticulated and ahistorical sense of authenticity with little or no reference to the significant philosophical discussions of the term. So what happens then if we explode these ideas and draw upon philosophy to think a little bit more broadly? Well, we are alerted perhaps to some of the binary oppositions that underscore some of the thinking about these ideas. So for example, the idea that there is a real world and a simulated world and inside and an outside authentic and inauthentic existing on a binary. And similarly, the binary of thinking about the digital as opposed to in person. Um, and as I'm gonna talk about, and as we are increasingly thinking about, it's much more entangled, much more complex than that. Um, and I like this quote from, from Neil Selwyn, who talks about how really anyone interested in contemporary education needs to be mindful of the complex relationships between education and technology. The digital is not simply a background feature or a narrow technical concern. So thinking in these silos, potentially misses drawing insight, I suggest, from literature that's enabling educators to think about the complexity of the world that we inhabit. And perhaps there's a need for an expanded conceptualization, the concept the con that connects conceptions of authenticity to notions of ontology and being. And I'm really interested in how we can move away from these binary conceptions of digital or in person and actually begin to smudge the lines of these enclosures of thought that current discourses surrounding the digital impose upon our thinking. How to do this? Well, I like to think with theory and um, some of the theories that I've drawn upon in my work come from post-humanist, new materialist and socio-material um, areas of work. There's some rich ideas there that we can draw upon to think about things like relational pedagogies and to think about some ideas. For example, Karen Barad talks about concepts such as interaction and entanglement, ways of thinking about connection in fresh new ways, which I find are really helpful for thinking about the digital and how we can think differently about the digital. 
And I've thought about this in terms of thinking about things like um, concepts of mattering, pedagogies of mattering, and how educational matterings are enacted, and the role of the digital in that. Thinking about spaces and places for connection, and thinking about presence, the concept of presence and absence in the digital university. So I'm really interested in thinking about how concepts like entanglement, how does thinking about entanglement and our entanglement with digital spaces, resources and devices provoke new questions for thinking about connection, presence and authenticity. We might move to understand assessment as a mode of situated relationalities. And I suggest that thinking about entanglement with digital spaces, resources and devices really helps us to think um, in fresh new ways. For example, how are bodies and subjectivities performed, cut, present and absent in digital spaces? How might we think about technologies not as tools, not simply just as tools, but as agentic, effective and powerful? This isn't just a theoretical exercise for me, and um, this is something I think about in my practice. So I um, lead a PG set in learning and teaching in higher education at my institution. And we think about the ways in which the digital is entangled in every aspect of the course design. Um, it's interwoven through the learning, through the practices, through the devices, through the resources. And really we think about digital education as education, moving away from this idea that the digital is somehow separate, external or other to what we're doing. And so I want to conclude by thinking that perhaps we might move to think about assessment as an interactive mattering that moves us beyond assessment as something primarily cognitive, rational and technical to thinking about a more complex understanding of it as effective material and relational processes. I suggest it's time for us to consider how both students and staff engage digitally and materially with assessment its objects, resources and spaces, and to ask ourselves what role does authenticity have to play in the ways in which educational matterings are enacted? Thank you so much, Karen. Really appreciate uh, you broadening us out and giving us broader sort of theoretical perspectives, making us think about sort of humanity and bodies as well. And I, I wanted to acknowledge that my body is not being seen by those online. So, if you, yeah, if you're thinking there's a disembodied voice, <laughs> uh, that person really does have a body as well. I guarantee it. Okay. Uh, Lucinda, over to you. Thanks, Phil, and thank you, everyone. And um, so Karen's gone out broad. I'm going to bring us down to something more narrow and concrete to give us something to sort of purchase on some of these things we're discussing. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge country, pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of the lands where we are now and where I live and work, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I want to start with a story about a student, an analogue story about a student who I taught in one of Deacon's Pathways programs who told me, she, she was in the, um, you know, a teacher pre-service um, stream heading in that direction, that in her history education at school, Every time anything came up in relation to Australian history and First Nations peoples, she was asked to leave the room and stand on her own in the corridor while that, you know, um, part of the lesson took place. And she was also excused, excused, so to speak, from completing any of the assessments that related in any way to that. So I just want to present that as a story to start off with to say I have no doubt that a well-designed learning bot or learning agent could have given that student, provided for that student, a more authentic, a more meaningful, more rewarding, more affirmative education, history education. So I am not determinist thinking that, you know, technology is bad. However, I also want to raise some issues today. So I'm going to talk about learning bots and learning agents because, to be honest, having researched GPT for the last two and a half years, I'm pretty jolly sick of it. But I'm still very interested in large language models, which are what's behind chat GPT and so on. 
and what's behind the learning bots and learning agents, which are the next thing that's coming for us. Some of you have already got them in your universities or schools. You're already using them. So essentially what they are is um, custom-designed bots or agents that operate with your own data inside a bubble. Your, do your data doesn't go outside um, the organisation, but so they can draw on everything in your intranet, so to speak, but they also have the large language model behind them. Moving from a bot to an agent, you're moving to something that has a memory, something that operates seamlessly with other technologies, whether search or whatever else, that, that knows you in a sense and that potentially you know, um, has a relationship with you and can also make decisions independent decisions in its own right. So it's developing a form of reasoning in a sense. So these are already in development and they're what's coming. So I want to give you an example of how one of these things would work. They will, they will develop um, and, and are already designing programs, designing assessment, designing rubrics, coaching students through tasks and assessing students at the end of tasks with the human in the loop, so to speak, to a greater ex or lesser extent at different stages here. They will do simultaneous kinds of formative and summative um, and diagnostic even, David, assessment, depending on how you program them. So that's all up for grabs. I want to give you a medical education example. So imagine you've got, um, and this is a real assignment at a university, a chronic disease study where a student has to take a patient, imagine a patient they have worked with um, and they have, they have a chronic disease, say diabetes, and they have to write a reflective account of what to having diabetes means for that patient in their life. Now, students do this task really badly, so I'm not going to mention which uni it is, um, but they, they are not empathetic with patients. They are impatient with patients. They use ableist language when they're talking about patients. And, and so if you were designing a task-related bottle agent, you would have that agent prompt this student when in their writing at any point they were not empathetic or whatever, you would, you would have the bot essentially acting as a patient with diabetes themselves. So that student in writing can be in dialogue with a patient with diabetes. So they've already had a real world experience and interaction with a person. So it's building on that too. But they, they, they can be coached, so to speak, by, by the bot inside the program and then assessed. Okay, so potentially the student can relate to, to the patient, to the issue, to the task in a more authentic, in a sense, way. The bot can meet you where you're at in real time. It can differentiate for you. It can explain when you need it to explain. It can, um, you know, overcome places where you maybe don't have the right, so to speak, cultural capital and fill in those gaps for you. Um, it's, it's synchronous and, and all of those sorts of things. However, we can already see with this kind of, I suppose you call it personalised learning, if you want to use that term, I think it's really problematic to use that term potentially, but already we see that debunked um, neuromyth type things like learning styles are being used to drive these things because you have to have categorization to do digital personalization and digital authenticity. So that's what techie people have gone back to because that seems a really easy way to do it. And, and that's what's coming out. So we need to have more educators. We need to have universities out there talking about this, speaking about this, making it really clear what's good and what's bad about these things. So the other question is who's on the teams developing these bots? How much input are educators having and people who know about educational policy and theory, who know about the things that Karina and Karen say have been talking about and can, can build these sorts of awarenesses and theoretical framings and conceptualizations into them? So who are the bots actually themselves authentic to? Who's, whose values and beliefs are they enacting? Those of the tech developers or those of educators in our field of education? What do they mean for the importance of having the opportunity to fail, to experiment and do those sorts of things when the surveillance of these programs is constant? So you exist to them not as a subject, an interpolated, addressed subject in a traditional sort of way, but you just exist as a continuous flow of data that can be monitored at any time. So it's been said that these sorts of programs actually bypass the notion of subjectivity. You don't even exist to them as a subject and therefore you don't have the opportunity to speak back. Um, anyone who's got their kids in school with continuous assessment probably knows what I'm talking about. 
So there's the, those invasive sort of elements which we already have people literally crowing about that they are using, eye tracking, emotion analysis, surveillance and those sorts of things um, inside these bots and agents, which we need to think really carefully and really critically about. How might they be useful? How can they be used in ethical ways? How can they be used at points where students maybe want them to be used, not where, you know, the institution or the teacher wants them to be used? How are educators deprofessionalised in this process? How is key intellectual, sophisticated sort of labour of educators replaced? Or are perhaps they being reprofessionalised in even more sophisticated ways as operating in hybrid ways with the technology and these sorts of design processes? What's the nature of large language models? They're fundamentally biased, tweaked, proprietary. They're made by men. You may be aware that... Um, the United Nations has just put out a big statement to say that the world is failing girls and women. So what does it mean that tech is, is men, that <laughs> the world that, and white men at that largely, we know statistically, what does that mean that the voice that is speaking to us in our assessment tasks is going to be this voice of, of generative AI, large language models packaged inside customised bots and agents? Um, yeah, so datafication, the whole subject thing, I've mentioned that, privacy, ethics and genealogy, how can we build criticality into our assessment tasks so that we're authentically aware of the nature of the technology that we're working with, even as we're simultaneously kind of hybridised with it, there's this, there's this gap. So, yeah, the ethics, uh, and I just want to say how can it all be authentic to the world that we're all facing and I just want to throw a couple of things out here because I'm finishing now. Um, for over 25 years, we've been talking about digital natives, digital literacies, whatever. Why has it been so difficult to realise these things? Why aren't they inside all of our assessment tasks already? If we don't address that, I'm not sure where we're going to go with this. And we also need to be thinking much more about the future that's already here. We need to think about, just for example, and this I love um, the theory that informs Karen's work as well, the post-humanist and new materialist sort of theory. So drawing on people like Nathan Snaza and John Weaver, what are assessment tasks that will value animals as much as humans, for example? What are assessment tasks that will treat environmental bodies like lakes and rivers as having legal rights? We already know in New Zealand that's happening. So what, what are, how can our assessment tasks be authentically responsive to the, to the real world, to the climate crisis, to the um, sort of egregious injustices that exist in the world and address them to make real change? Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucinda. Um, really appreciate the challenge that you set out for us there in assessment for, for going beyond what we might normally do. Uh, I'm somewhat scared that they'll develop a bot that's able to chair a panel and say mildly amusing things between the speakers. So I'm just going to hand it over to Kevin. Thank you, Phil. And if they do invent that bot, it won't be standing up every so often when it's needed to to remind people we've only got five minutes. <laughs> um, no, it will execute you. It'll execute, that's right. <laughs> So I would, also would like, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're gathered here today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future uh, and also acknowledge uh, the events. That we've done. Um, Phil uh, called out my, uh, he outed my military background. Um, so I'm going to fall back on my inner soldier for the little piece of the preamble that I have and seek to try and be as practical as I can, thinking about what is the role of the digital in authenticity of assessment. And we understand, of course, that the digital is, is ubiquitous uh, now. I think, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're certainly on the way and um, we're, probably, uh, we're probably emerging into that space. So if I think about authentic assessment, and this is something that I've um, had the opportunity to say over the last couple of days, I, I think of authenticity not as a form of assessment in and of itself, but as a principle that informs the design of assessment and its delivery. And I know that the notion of the broadness of assessment, of the design of assessment um, can be challenging. And I'm not here talking about just exactly 
how you design the ways in which you're going to deliver a particular assessment and then execute that particular assessment. I'm talking about more from a, from a broader um, concept around designing of assessment, probably at a programmatic level. But I think we do need to see it as a principle of to inform assessment design, not the type of assessment design. It's not multiple choice, an exam, an authentic assessment or an essay. It's authenticity in assessment more broadly as a principle that can inform any of those types of assessment. And I also think that irrespective of modality of delivery and irrespective of the digital and technology, we probably as educators do need to ensure that it is the principles of pedagogical practice or the principles of educational design, whether that's assessment or something else, that largely informs our practice. So I'm going to switch that notion up shortly by saying that we probably should be prepared to look at the affordances that technology offer us to deliver assessments in different ways. But I do think that as educators, we do need to hold true to some of those principles of good educational practice, good as practice, good assessment design practice, because they stood the test of time for a long time. And they are important and they are really what often underpins a rigorous and quality assured education process. But maybe it is, having said that, maybe it is time for us to be a little bit more prepared to allow the affordances of technology to challenge some of our paradigms of assessment design and delivery and enable us to think about and offer different, in brackets, better ways of assessing. <clears throat> because it's certainly clear that the, um, the ecosystems, the digital ecosystems that we all inhabit now, uh, bring with them a range of technologies that offer multiple different ways of accessing a learning experience, engaging with a learning experience, including the assessment of that learning experience. It offers much richer ways for us to gather data points and evidence about how students are experiencing that particular learning. And we probably should be more prepared to be thinking about the ways, the progressive ways in which those technologies might challenge some of our thinking about the way that we might design and deliver something like an assessment, but also more constructively thinking about the ways that it might offer us better opportunities to assess. And it might also be, I don't exactly know how this is achieved, but I do have a sense as somebody who works in that educational technology space that it might also be that technology will offer us ways to scale up some of those authentic assessments and help us to support larger student bodies um, in ways that we haven't been able to do with more traditional analog approaches um, that used properly. Those technologies can also create that enhanced sense of engagement for students. And we know from the literature that engagement is such an important word because students who feel engaged with an institution when they struggle or have a problem are more likely to seek out a way to resolve the problem or the challenge as opposed to leave the institution. And for lots of universities, certainly my university, QUT, and I strongly suspect this university where I'm sat today, um, we can't make lazy assumptions about students' preparedness um, and capability to engage with the educational, higher education experience. So we have to think about the ways that we scaffold their ability to access that learning experience and engage with that learning experience. And when they're struggling in that learning experience, provide ways to support them to succeed because we charge our students an awful lot of money to come and learn with us. And we make promises about what will happen in their lives at the end of that experience. So the onus is on us from a moral perspective, as well as a business perspective, to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to ensure that they're best prepared and have the best opportunity to succeed in that education. Um, one of the... Um, one of the conversations that we have at my university um, when we've talked about the digital, uh, I've sought to contextualise the digital conversation in two parts. And it's how I frame it as being either digital in part or digital at part. 
And when I use the phrase digital in part, what I mean is that we will use technologies, we will buy systems, but we'll think about how we skew those systems to, to harness them, to maintain the analog ways that we do our business. So we'll look to find a technology and seek to make that technology do what we've traditionally done and maybe enable us to do it better. Um, I think a really good example of this, and I'm not making any value statement one way or another, would be online proctoring. So instead of thinking about can technologies offer us better ways to do things, we're looking at the technologies um, and trying to skew them to fit the existing paradigms of delivery. Digital at heart is when we truly embrace the digital technologies, recognize that we live and exist in a digital world, and start allowing, as I said, the affordances of those technologies to change our thinking and the ways in which we practice. The end. Thank, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I stood up right when you mentioned remote proctoring, and then I'm like, oh, actually, I, I, want, I want him to go there. I want him. Yeah, but we're not here to have the remote proctoring argument unless we are. Uh, no, okay. Um, panelists, if you have any brief sort of comments on what each other has said, we, we do have a short moment here, an optional moment. Lucinda is. Yeah, I'm just interested because just to pick up on a sort of theme that we've mentioned, this idea of data points and knowing students, so to speak, as data points. And, and I've been a bit more, well, highlighted some critical sort of things about that. When is data too much data? Because one of the things that I think Neil Selwyn critiques as well is just this over collection of data and storage of the data. And we've got to remember that there's an actual, you know, planetary cost to the storage of data. So I'm just interested in, in that question, so to speak. I don't know who. I'm happy to have a first go at that. <clears throat> and I do have some views on um, data, particularly learning analytics. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have in higher education is not that we're short of data. We're actually awash with the stuff. We're drowning in data. We've got systems that tell us all sorts of things. What we're not clear about is what are the, what are the important points in the data that we need that are telling us the things that we need to know to help us to assist a student. And when we do know those things, I'm not clear that we've tied our systems and processes to those data points sufficiently so that if we understand that there's a student struggling over here, how are we using that information to bring that student to the service that supports them or vice versa? <clears throat> um, so, so I think that... Um, I think that those are two of the pragmatic challenges, but I think there's also a bigger challenge that we talked about in one of the sessions um, in passing earlier today. Just because we can doesn't necessarily mean that we should. And I don't think we thought clearly enough about the, um, the principles that we need to guide us in terms of informing us when we use data, where we use data and how we use data. And I fear that technology is driving us along pathways because we can do things that we've not sufficiently, and, and Karina touched on this a bit earlier in one of our sessions, we're not sufficiently paused and thought to ourselves, is this the right thing to do at the right time and in the right way? Because providing the wrong piece of evidence or data to the wrong person at the wrong time can potentially have catastrophic effects. I just... I will not repeat what Kevin said. I, my answer aligns perfectly with his answer. I just want to add uh, two points. Um, I just invite you to think about why we are actually uh, considering relying on data, digital traces, as I call them, actually not learning analytics, on students' activities. And in at least in our context, in Norwegian and European context, I guess it's related to the fact that um, student experience, self-reported student experience were taking as departure point or a reference point for assessing the quality of education or of teaching and assessment for that matter, uh, which is a relatively subjective measure, um, if I am allowed to make another statement. So data is considered as a sort of a, a form of, well, can provide triangulation uh, and an objective matter and agree with Kevin that uh, it should be uh, collected purposefully in a customized way and uh, uh, not at all times and not any type of data. And second, and that's the argument that I've been sort of trying to emphasize when I mentioned research is um, 
Iterative designs are typical for design-based research, but they can be very uh, easily applicable in, in educational practice context. Um, and that that's where data brings or provides insights into the process. And we are very interested in this progression because this is one aspect that, again, it's not easily uncovered through self-reports or uh, the output or the outcome that's graded at the end. But And I think this is one important element when considering self authentic assessment if we are to be true to um, supporting students' progress and development. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in and say well, we've also got this other data in this thing called assessment where we get students to do things and then we could look at what they've done and we could pay people to look at those things and then from that we could infer things to do. Uh, I just feel like too often we get caught up in the analytics thing rather than this thing we already spend a lot of money on where we've, we can see literally what students can do. Um, I'd love to throw over to colleagues in the room if anyone has a question. The way we're going to run this is hands up and Amina has jumped in with the first hand up and we have a microphone and people online who way outnumber us in the room need us to use the microphone. Thank you to the panel for your generous knowledge and your time. Uh, my question is probably more directed at Krina, but I'd love to hear from anybody. Um, but it just follows on what you started with, Krina. Um, but as Lucinda probably knows, Timnit Gebru, an Ethiopian scholar, called out large language models and AI over a decade ago, but nobody listened to her. Um, so uh, my question is, um, what constitutes in your view, assessment knowledge and research. How does it uphold or subvert capitalist, positivist, and white patriarchal hetero notions of research and authenticity? Thank you. Well, that's definitely a question that puts me on the spot, isn't it? <laughs> For many, many reasons. I'm not really sure I can provide a very knowledgeable answer to this. Um, I would say that, it, and this is definitely a layperson answer, um, as I'm not an expert on any of the area that you're suggesting or referring to. Um, I would say that being at a first, very first level, a basic level, being inclusive of students' voices in all possible regards, in all possible ways, is the place to start. Um, and I think this is a, a prerequisite for any type of um, measure uh, or steps we take uh, into formulating learning outcomes, learning designs, uh, and assessment designs. Um, and adding the layers of knowledge provided through different types of data, whether self-reported or uh, collected automatically, should, um, should be sort of uh, complementary to that. Uh, but in any case, the, this should be always considered in relation to uh, this departure point that I mentioned. And I think I will invite Lucinda to play into that because I see she's eager. Uh, it's a great question. And there are people in the room who will know that I draw on Timnit Gebru's work a lot and have referred people to it previously. And so um, I just want to say that there are people out there like Timnit doing fantastic work to say, go back and create new lang large language models from scratch that have a different kind of training corpus, that have a legal training corpus, um, you know, that, that doesn't have the same kinds of issues with copyright and doesn't have the same kinds of issues with narrowing down the voices or voice of, of that model, so to speak. Um, you know, a, a really interesting example is First Nations knowledges, cultural knowledges, and the way that they're not out there on the internet because First Nations people want to retain control of those knowledges, understandably, given the way they've been stripped from them and, um, you know, have, the, have had them attempted to be extinguished. So they're not out there. So it, it, chat GPT struggles to speak in, in those voices and, and recently has refused to even attempt to speak in those voices because it's been told that it shouldn't because that's not politically correct or whatever. However, it leads to silences and silencing in certain ways. And, and, you know, these are the kinds of critical conversations we need to have with students 
um, and to think about as researchers as well in terms of what tools we're choosing to use, what are the affordances and limitations of different tools, who designed them, who's responsible for them, what's the transparency that's there. So we need to build that, that into assessment tasks, almost into every single assessment task, I think, in order to be authentic to the nature of the um, hybridised complex world that we're in and in order to retain our democracies fundamentally because this is what we're, we're talking about and to make them more just, like I was saying. Thanks, Lucinda and um, Karina. And thanks, Amina, for the question. I just wanted to add a small point, well, a massive point, but a brief point that, that I think it's really important just to remember at all times that education is an ethical matter. Um, and I really love what Bell Hooks writes and she talks about the classroom, whether that's a in-person or hybrid or digital classroom as a space of possibility. And I think we need to be mindful that all our educational interactions, entanglements, relations are underpinned by the kinds of values that we care about and that we are passionate about and that we think critically and thoughtfully about the ways in which we can make spaces to enact those values. Thank you. We, we are at the four o'clock mark, which is not the full on end, but it's the sort of soft end for if you've got to run off to another meeting, and you want to leave gracefully. So this is largely for the online people who've got like a four o'clock meeting. I mean, hell, it's also for the panellists. If you feel like you're done, panellists. <laughs> but does it apply to me as well? We could, um, but yeah, if that's you, thank you for being here. But we are going to continue on till about the four thirty mark. Um, I'm going to jump onto a question from online, and then we'll go one in the room, and probably back and forth like that for a bit. Uh, online, our most upvoted question. Remember to thumbs up those questions. Is from Chad Gladovich. Is in the present time dominated by digital technologies and the challenge of misinformation, including academic dishonesty. Can digital tools genuinely offer authentic assessment or do they inherently risk compromising the depth and authenticity of understanding and learning? Now, I'm not sure who this one is, is best for. Uh, Kevin's got his. I'll start. Um, I think that given that we live and work and exist in a digital age, we have no choice but to engage with technologies and think about how they may or may not afford us opportunities to do things more authentically. So um, I, I talk about a digital age because I think I'm an economic historian by, um, by education and learned about how we move from an agrarian society to an industrial society through a process of industrial revolution. And that was not a neat process. We didn't all go to, well, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere and in Europe, we didn't all go to bed on one Friday in an agrarian age and wake up the following Monday in an industrial age, depending on who you talk to or read. That was a process that took about 150 years. And I think equally, we are now on the cusp between being in an industrial age and an information age, a digital age. And I think a lot of the challenges that we have are the same challenges around dislocation and literacy and notions of knowing and productivity that occurred in exactly the same way during the Industrial Revolution. And I think it's going to take us probably another 50 years or more to fully move ourselves into a digital age. We're not there yet. We're not going back. <clears throat> and younger people who are brought up in that digital age, and I don't know that I necessarily ascribe to the notion of digital natives because I know lots of older people like me who are just as capable of using technologies as younger people. So it's not that simplistic, but it is certainly about moving into a world where we exist within digital ecosystems as well as physical ones. Ah, oh, yay. This is for me. <laughs> so I, and I totally agree with what you said, Kevin. Um, I just want to say it's not the technology. It's not the technology. It's what people do with it. So you look at how chat GPT is being promoted, hello, as a research tool, a research tool where you know what it tells you is not true. What on earth are we thinking of? This is universities saying it. they've got out up there on their websites about how they're teaching their PhD students to use chat GPT as a research tool. No, it's going to give you false references and citations. It makes stuff up. So 
But it's not the technology's fault. It's really interesting, fascinating technology. What they've done is amazing and, and thrilling and intriguing. And it's going to do amazing things in the world for, for medicine and all kinds of things. So, you know, you we've got to think, okay, misinformation. We know chat GPT is giving us misinformation every old time we use it. So why are we pretending it's something else? And this, this takes us back to what I was talking about earlier today, the, the ELISA effect, the way we're so seduced, so readily seduced by these bots, anchoring bias where we believe the first thing that we see. And I think that we're in the process of developing some protocols that will address that problem, things like human first. You don't go first to chat DPT to ask it to give you a rubric for whatever or 10 ideas for whatever. You do the human brainstorming first and then you, in an iterative sort of way, refine your idea with the large language model. So that's just an example off the top of my head of the kind of protocol that I think is going to help us moving forward to engage more ethically and more critically and, and more creatively too with these things because, honestly, has anyone gone back to something they got chat GPT to write? for them uh, like a week or two later and thought what the hell was that I thought that was good at the time hang on a moment no that was just kind of sexy sounding <laughs> so we have another question in the room then we're going to go on am I allowed to just, yes, you just are allowed put, to. very quick reply because I was planning to reply um to chat chat um with the answer, I hope not, because, um, and then Lucinda replied um, immediately, it's about how we do, what we do with technology. And at, I'm, I'm using an expression that we kind of, I kind of promoted at my university and, and now it's, I'm, I'm scared to death that everyone is using it. It's about pedagogical use of technology and it may sound cliche, it may sound really trivial, but it, it in the end, this was the phrase that actually, uh, got traction at the university after years of discussing with the IT department, uh, Kevin, uh, about why we should not simply buy a learning management platform because the vendor provided us with a discount and it's one that's most used in Scandinavia. So to, to move over that argument, my, my actually my thought through a um, uh, comment here was that we should use, um, we should think of this integrated way of, of in, in, including technology in our practices. And my idea of integrated is integrated, integrating learning uh, activities with assessment and in the same way, uh, using the digital tools to support throughout the whole process in an, in an integrated way, both learning and assessment, instead of divorcing the two and make, making technology, as, a, as I said, as an add-on towards the end. But I don't think that that we should assign that agency to to technology. And I'm sorry, Karen, for um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can disagree. But I think we have to we have to balance out that agency and uh, take the advantage of what technology offers. Yet uh, decide the purpose of use ourselves. Oh, sorry. Can I just say though, the, you can have the idea of um, of machines having agency, but having just different kinds of agency. You know, humans have different kinds of agency. We've got hands; they give us a fundamental, really sophisticated kind of agency. So it's not just one or the other; it's different different kinds. Thank you very much, panelists. We, we have an in the room question now. Yep. Thank you for your research to the panel. My questions for Professor Lucinda. You mentioned the scenario where there was a student that was excluded from a class from participating in a p particular part of it. And the response was, well, why can't we have a bot cater to her uniquely? And my question is, if we're gonna take an ethical uh, humanistic approach to prioritizing things that should be handled in an ethical way, why is it not perhaps the educator being schooled by the bot about how to appropriately conduct such a class? I, I think that's a brilliant idea. I think I think you know that should definitely be there in the picture. So I was just using that example to show that I it was really to highlight the failings of that educator and to to make out that it's not always that a human version of something is a preferable version because that was a terrible human version. Um, and that a bot that had been, say, developed with local First Nations peoples and, you know, had their input could, could provide a really fantastic learning experience potentially. But it's only one of a lot of ways to, to address, um, you know, 
that sort of thing, which I think, unfortunately, this was a recent example. It wasn't a long time ago or anything. So that's what students in secondary school are experiencing. And we're wondering how something like the voice referendum outcome can be what it is. And then we look at education and have to wonder. So, yeah, I think that um, it's in the quality of the design of the bots. But ultimately, obviously, if you were taking that sort of First Nations epistemological sort of approach, you'd want to work with local people face-to-face, -face, sit down, yarn with them, story with them, have a narrative sort of approach to whatever was developed. So, yeah, it's it's about how you go about it, I think. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's not that a bot is better than a person or that a bot would necessarily, you know, fix the solution. Oh, I'm not, I'm not a tech boosterist. I'm not saying tech is the solution at all. Thank, thanks, Lucinda. We, we have a question online now. Uh, the question's from Matt Brett, who firstly says, great session. Thanks, everyone. Much of the discussion is about authenticity in institutional controlled assessment. I wonder if anyone on the panel has thoughts about how authenticity might be relevant in assessing requests for recognition of prior learning. Noting universities primarily privilege learning from other universities, followed by employment, and really valuing learning in life, particularly gendered activities like caring. Anyone got any thoughts on this one? Can I just say that I think it would be fantastic if generative AI could <laughs> assess those those applications um, and be be trained, be trained in a sensitive sort of way to value caring as it could be. It's the sort of admin kind of task. You know, when when one of those requests comes through to me, or email, could you please evaluate this? I think, oh no, I'm going to have to read all those institutional documents and map this onto this, or you know, other academics know what I mean. Um, and it's just the sort of thing that technology does really easily, really well, and in a second. So yeah, I, I hope that's the way we're going to go. I think Kevin indicated next. I don't know that I would necessarily be making the assumption that um, <clears throat> that those experiences are not is not already counted as a part of an RPL process, a recognition of prior learning process. And obviously, certification credentials from other institutions will will count. But I and and I'm not across this area in detail. But my understanding is that recognition of prior learning is much broader than just checking somebody's credentials against your credentials and making sure that they match up, that, um, that experience is often brought into the equation and considered because most universities, when they set their entrance criteria, particularly for postgraduate, you know, there, there is always that caveat around or X number of years experience. Um, so I think it's more about evidencing and I'm not aware that any institution, certainly that I'm aware of, would preclude um, making space for that for experience. Not to say that technology can't make the assessment better, but I think as a matter of principle, I'm not aware it's precluded. Uh, Karen, you, you reach for the microphone. Yeah, I was just gonna say, it's a really interesting point, Matt. Um, thank you for that. And it's actually interesting because it's not something that's come up in our really rich, um, expansive discussions so far. And uh, all I wanted to add is that just reminds me just how complex and messy um, uh, this, this, this idea is, um, how it's so difficult to pin down even what we mean by authentic assessment um, and the real need to go beyond thinking of it as something uh, straightforward and um, related to tasks, but to thinking about all the implications of thinking about authenticity in a broader sense. Um, thinking about um, authenticity as becoming, authenticity to do with the development of um, subjectivities and identities um, and connections. So, so I don't have anything specific on that point, but just to, to say thank you for adding just another element into the mix and reminding me of the need for us to really explode this concept and think about all of its different elements. Thank you for that question. And I'm adding actually a dilemma, not an answer to this. Um, with, and with, with an example, one of my PhD students, I would like to give him credit for this. Uh, he's working on uh, how or examining how students in software engineering are learning with resources from outside the educational or formal educational context. And this is online platforms. So software programmers, professional platforms. 
And this adds obviously another layer of complexity to the assessment of, uh, of, of learning in, in this particular uh, example, which there isn't. There is no teachers have to find uh, creative ways of assessing how what students have learned while using resources that they, they were not provided through the formal curriculum. And what uh, Andres Raos, my student, is is uh, it's he's coining this as the shadow curriculum in his in, in his own way. Um, but basically what's raising the question, what the question being uh, risen here is, is this a form of assessment that is actually uh, more authentic? Is it uh, assessing the authentic ways of, of learning students devise themselves, uh, accessing resources they find relevant for their learning process in order to actually address curriculum, the cur curricular demands? Thank you. So I hope someone has an answer to that. Uh, I think, do we take this one as a question for the panel? Yeah, is there someone want to? Well, I, I'm just reflecting on what um, Karina was saying there. When you think about it, um, offering real lived world professional experience as, um, as some kind of marker to assist you in gaining entrance to a university course, that's probably the ultimate authentic assessment for us to assess. You know, that you are actually working in a field or in practice and you are delivering authentic, you are being assessed authentically. And therefore, maybe the challenge is for us to understand how we, how we understand and interpret that evidence and use that to enable those pathways to occur more, more seamlessly. Thank you. So I think, Matt, for you, you're, you're totally onto something here, I think. Um, in the room, Margaret Peterman. Oh, thank you so much. Really enjoying the discussion. So I have a really sort of um, teachery question, really. And we've had some conversation about conversations about the digital and introducing them and so forth. And I was just wondering, if you had to give advice to someone on the ground, you know, someone who was teaching or maybe, you know, you, you are teaching teachers, um, how would you suggest that they raise the question of the digital in this conversation about authentic assist assessment or even spreading more broadly to, you know, a thought authentic assessment set in curricula? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, this this is well it's it's simple in some ways but complex in others the simple bit of it is um again it goes back to what i was saying we all live and exist in a digital ostensibly a digital world now and i'm kind of surprised if i'm having to have a conversation with somebody who is looking to situate their practice entirely in the analog as if digital doesn't exist in the first place um I work in university, so I understand that, of course, there are people who, <laughs> whose praxis is um, predicated along those lines. But I, but I think that that probably is the starting point for the conversation, that um, it's very, very rare that any of us get to exist in that very pure, non-digital space. And, and even if we make decisions not to engage with social media and those kind of things, technology, the digital ecosystem is ubiquitous and surrounds us in all aspects of what we do anyway. So um, I think I would probably struggle to find how somebody could opt out and still expect to be relevant. Can I go? Um, thanks, Margaret, for that question. I think if I was speaking to teachers about how to um, start to think or, or continue to think with these um, ideas of the, both the digital and authenticity and, uh, and authentic assessment, I think I would want to encourage them to, um, uh, like with many educational concepts, approach them in really thoughtful ways and look at all the complexity. So avoid a um, simplistic focus, but look at all the nuances and different sides of the argument. So, for example, thinking about um, the digital as being uh, um, ubiquitous and as being entangled as, and as being a part of our, our everyday lives and what that means for 
our engagements. I would encourage them to think about authenticity in all its complexity. So engaging with the wider literature in education that's explored the concept of authenticity in connection with um, teacher becomings and students' identities. Um, I think something that's really interesting is expanding the conversation about authentic assessment to think about questions, for example, to do with the, the role of trust um, in assessment and curriculum design, thinking about the, the idea of multiple authenticities, who, who gets to decide whose um, uh, who's authenticity we're talking about or, or um, whether an assessment is authentic. Um, how do we think about um, including multiplicity when we think about authenticity and curriculum design? How do we make spaces for, for dialogue? How do we make spaces for students' situated experiences and situated learning journeys? So I would um, ask the, the new teacher to think about lots of really challenging ideas um, and sit with that uncertainty and not be afraid, actually, that it's troubling, that it's um, uh, uh, it's not easy to, to tie up with a bow, but actually to enjoy that, that liminal space and sit with those questions and continue to question as they develop throughout their careers, because we're always we're always questioning and grappling with these ideas. And that's how we develop thoughtful, critical practice, I believe. I'm sorry to cut us off. We're almost at our time. I feel so bad. There's, there's. I, I'd love to just continue this for another few hours, but as I said, you're welcome to leave. So probably you would leave, and I'll be left here. Um, I want us to finish with a question from Simon Buckingham Sherman. I'd like all of our panelists to give a yes or no, and then a one sentence why to this. So we're thinking yes or no, and then one sentence why. Would the panel agree that we have failed our students if they graduate without fluency in their disciplinary slash sector standard generative AI tools? So would you agree that we've failed our students if they graduate without fluency in their disciplinary or sector standard generative AI tools? Can I go? Yeah, you, you're up first. first. So, um, yeah, I, I very firmly believe that if there's one thing we know about technology, it is that the tech goes down. Yes. Do we know that? If you're a classroom teacher, you know the technology does not work. The, the broadband's down, the thing doesn't work, the machine is broken, the start button doesn't go on, whatever. So for that reason alone, we still have to teach people to be able to do things without the tech, Simon, but also we have to teach people still to think and Composing, creating, um, you know, writing, so to speak, that is intimately, cognitively linked to thinking. And so whatever discipline you're in, our assessment tasks have to find ways to assess whether people can actually think both with, with these machines and without. So, Phil, you talked about having rooms around the place where people are going to be assessed, pen and paper, whatever, no technology. I think that's probably one of the multiple diverse ways we will assess still in the future. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in for Simon here and say you didn't give me a yes or no. <laughs> I want a yes or no to the question. Would the panel agree that we've failed our students if they graduate without oh, Without a doubt. Um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Can I go next because I want to say no. <laughs> great, great. This, is, this will give us some drama. We wanted some drama. <laughs> So I'd say no, um, because I do agree with you that I think our, our responsibility is to encourage to question. But no, I wouldn't say that we had failed. And crucially, I wouldn't also say that it wouldn't be the teacher's responsibility, because I think learning is a is a mutual engagement of teacher and student responsibility. So that's why I choose no. I want to nuance that, but I'm not allowed to. But it really depends with, with the meaning of fluency. But uh, I would say I agree with Karen, no, um, if we take fluency in its strict sense. Um, the tools and technology, they renew every so many years. Uh, when our, these graduates are in, will be in, uh, in workplaces, there will be another, another generation of technology. But I think it's very important. That's where I would say, yes, we fail if we don't if we don't succeed in helping these graduates to learn to think and analyze critically the mechanisms by which this technology functions and how it can actually be meaningful for their practice. Thank you. So we, we have 
two no's, one emphatic yes. And Kevin? I should be a maybe, shouldn't I? But um, so what I think, I think that's an extremely complex question. I think it goes to the, the heart of um, the role of um, AI in the specific discipline. <clears throat> and if within the context of a particular discipline, AI is already a necessary and important tool that enables a graduate to achieve their work outcomes, then the answer is yes. Wow, so we have a qualified yes, an emphatic yes, and two no's. I'd like everyone to give a round of applause to our panellists. Now, I'm not changing my voice to the people online. I'm not doing an impersonation. I'm handing over to Rola now, who, oh, you'll be able to see her because she's going to go in the shot. All right. <laughs> um, I'm just going to wrap up, folks, and I'm going to do it quickly. I'm going to start by thanking the panel and everyone who's taken part in yesterday's panel and the first session that we had, which was Karina, um, on the uh, keynote. So... With this international symposium, we've had three events. Over those events, we've had over 500 people join us, um, take part, participate in chat, ask questions in the room and online. Um, this shows how topical, I guess, authentic assessment is. But what I've noticed in the conversation is how wide ranging it is. And that's probably not surprising in, in, a, in a couple of ways. Firstly, authenticity itself, there's no consensus around. But secondly, um, everything is connected. You can't talk about assessment without talking about the culture of the university, without talking about the purpose of higher education, without talking about the ways in which policies, learning outcomes, procedures, um, pedagogy, all of those things order practice around assessment and I, and I think both of those things have contributed to the wide-ranging conversation so I'm gonna I'm gonna conclude with just a few themes that I've pulled out from this from these three sessions so far um, in terms of thinking about authentic assessment we really need to look to process and outcome it needs to be iterative so it's not just a one-off but actually really thinking about how do either multiple tasks feed into each other or how do um, or, or, or how do we and how do we get data from one iteration to inform the next iteration in terms of design in terms of engaging students in terms of identifying what the important data points are that help us to understand a students engaging authentically b stepping into a space where they feel they're being authentic and see the task design itself is authentic and that brings me to thinking about authenticity not just as something we do as teachers or educators and saying yep tick box done assessment is authentic but actually then to really challenge ourselves and ask is the quality of the educational process itself authentic? Are the students experiencing this as authentic? And if not, why not? And, and maybe, you know, maybe the curriculum itself then is too demanding or too overcrowded if there is instrumentalism, for example. So there's, there's things that we need to look at, not just as a, a priori design, but actually the whole notion of engagement throughout. Evaluative judgment has loomed large um, because that's what is the unique human element in all of this in terms of working with AI um, and the digital and collaboration, working together, learning together. Those are things that really prompt us to think not just about assessing students as individuals, but actually assessing them within a collective, within creating assessment that affords things that enable them to engage in the practice authentically with others. Agency of students, so how, creating space for students to be agentic, to have choice, to act ethically. And finally, the notion of relationality and connection, and that's about building relationships in assessment, creating the space for there to be relationships between the student and the teacher, but also the student and Gen AI, if we are incorporating that into the process. Um, so these are some of the kind of my learnings and, and to think about all of this, and if we're gonna do this within authentic 
with an assessment that is authentic, we need to start to think programmatically. And I, I do think that is really important to decouple from individual units and allow for assessment that integrates from different places. Um, these are just some of my reflections you may uh, not, but I think we've covered some of these threads throughout. And, and these are just things that are kind of hanging up with me now. So look out for some of the work that might come out from this symposium. There's a paper um, that has been accepted by the Cradle team. There's a special issue that we are putting together that will be out in October next year. And no doubt there'll be some other papers and some Cradle suggests in there. Um, and we look forward to engaging with you a little bit more. And finally, my final plug is we have a session on the 28th of November um, with my colleague Karen Gravett and Sarah O'Shea, where this is the next Cradle um, seminar, just to give a plug. It's on our research on belonging in higher education, another big topic, but we're going to share with you some of our research findings and um, really talk about belonging and, and some of the troubles it raises. So with that, thank you all. And please join us for wine and cheese. Apologies to the online people. Um, we will keep you in our thoughts. Thank you. <laughs>